So I'm starting the recording. Um, you'll notice that today is exercise three. It's the milestone check-in um, for the models. So what that means is um, your models are approximately 90% complete. Um, and we can review your schedule and your asset list. And your materials and textures are about 50% complete. I'm going to be a little bit flexible on that, um, on the particularly the materials part. Um, hopefully you all have some work done on materials. However, I will say if, if what I open up and look at is just everything as a gray model, um, I'm going to mark that one as a fail until you, until you revise it. Okay? So that will be in the revision folder. Um, we'll look at this here in a minute. I, I have a, I, I realize we need to, like, this is 3D animation. We need a day, of, a day or two of talking about animation stuff, right? Partially because um, a big portion of you um, have taken principles of animation and animation fundamentals, and then this is your next animation class, right? And we spent a lot of this class talking about all of the things that are not setting keyframes, right? Um, and so I wanted to have a, a day or, well, it's actually I have it sort of blocked out for three different days um, of talking about different elements of animation and um, and what I thought today would be is a little bit more of a, a recap of the process and the things that you need to be thinking about in the animation process. Um, I have a feeling that there is probably no one in the room who is ready to start animating today. Is that correct? Is there anybody ready to start? All right. We need to get to that point relatively soon because our next milestone is um, for our blocking pass. Right? And that's a little ways away. That's um, November uh, 5th. This is sort of the biggest gap we have in our milestones, um, short of the Thanksgiving break. Um, but that's not a lot of time to get all of your blocking done. Right? Um, so let's, let's uh, spend the next few days of class kind of addressing rigging issues, uh, material issues, all of that stuff. And we're going to have a, a big chunk of work time in here. Um, but today and maybe a little bit next week, um, we're going to be talking a little bit more about um, animation. And so I, I may sort of pepper in some work days uh, throughout there. Most of my lectures will be pretty short uh, things. Um, today's is actually really pretty controlled. Um, so before the end of class today, um, up here, exercise three milestone. Um, put the files in there. Um, they can be just single gray renders, um, but just some time before class is over with, uh, even if you just want to pop them all into one scene, do a render of them, um, one image will take care of that. Um, and I would like to see your sort of some form of progress on your schedule. So again, I'll give you a little bit of time at the end of class here to be working on that too, so that way you can kind of pay attention to the lecture. Um, I do want to talk just a little bit about um, do I? No. I'm trying to think if there's anything I need to cover. Yeah. So our next milestone is the blocking pass of all of your shots. Okay, so just kind of that's a heads up of what's coming up in a few weeks. Um, but I think we're all kind of on, on schedule for that. I want to talk a little bit about this week's um, schedule. Where am I at? Yeah, we are right here. The 17th animation blocking. Now, one of the biggest issues uh, we have, or I have in classes, is that each semester there's a break, right? There's a fall break in this semester and a Thanksgiving break. And both of those breaks really just suck the wind out of a semester. Like they, like we will be moving along, getting stuff done. Um, and then suddenly uh, we have this break that really just like zaps our energy, zaps our momentum, and sort of slows it down. So we just had one. I hope you had fun. I hope you did some cool things. I hope you, whatever, maybe refreshed you a little bit. At the very least, it was a couple of days you didn't have to come to class, right? Um, 
but now we're back and I, I need you to make a conscious effort to sort of get back into work mode, right? Um, not, not that I have any belief or uh, any reason to doubt that you can, it's more that throughout every semester I've been through, there's always this like, Ugh. like it's like we trudge through these next couple of days and we end up losing some of that momentum we had on the project. And that happens again after Thanksgiving break. So kind of make a conscious effort, effort to do the, you know, like, you know when you're falling asleep and you have to do like, uh, wake up, come on, let's go, right? Like re, like um, motivate yourself to, to kind of get on the ball on this. Um, because I don't want like a bad week knocking you, you back and, and getting, um, you know, causing you to not be able to finish the project. So, um, having said that, how are you feeling about the project? How, how's, it, how's it going? I'm behind. You're behind? How many of you feel like you're a little behind? <laughs> how many of you feel like you're a lot behind? Okay, Sean feels a lot behind. <laughs> That's all right. Um, how many of you feel like you're kind of on schedule? Like you're... Okay, that's all right. Um, it's okay if you do, um, it's okay if you don't, but that's one of the reasons I have the schedule or have you do a schedule. Yes, sir. I actually did textures for all three of my stuff because I didn't know textures were supposed to be main stuff. I actually did more blogging than I did with textures. Okay, well turn that in then. If, you, if you've already started animating, I, I can, I can kind of adjust it. Yeah, um, I think what you're wanting to do though is you would probably point constraint um, the group of the object, right? So let me let me show you really quickly on this. So let's say it, it keeps going to the pivot point in the center, and I want it to like go Well, so what we can do, let, let me see if this is, this may be something we just kind of look at kind of offline and we can talk about it a little bit more. Let's say this is like a panel or something like that you're wanting to open up, right? Um, on this. Um, I can change my pivot point. I can hit insert and move my pivot point down to here. Right? And I can animate that pretty easily opening and closing, right? Um, but what I'm animating is my translates and rotates, right? Now, if I point constrain this, or if I constrain this in any way, if I go to constraint, it's under animation, sorry. If I go to constrain and parent constrain that, you'll see now I can't actually animate those because something else is trying to control them, yeah. right? So what, what the trick to that is, is you group that object to itself. So P cube, I'm just gonna hit control G. And so now it's in a group. And what I can do is then I can constrain the group to my torus, right? So I can do constrain parent. And so now all of those things that are locked are now in my group. And if I move this around, you know, this still goes with it, but this P cube still has clean values on here that I can animate. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, because I was like, I couldn't get Yeah. So I think that that's probably what you're what you're wanting for. That. So this is, but these are good questions, um, particularly because I think what we're getting into now is going to be a lot of those little problem solving things. That's a little bit rigging, but there's a lot of little things in terms of animation I want to cover. That is like, I want to call them like tricks, like things to be to be thinking about. Um, and some of it's going to be how you set up your rig to make it animatable more efficiently. I know several of you are needing like 2D rigs for the face. Um, and that's something I need to do just a touch more research before I do a full lecture on that. But that's probably what's going to come up in Monday's class um, is sort of an animated like 2D texture, animating and driving other things with animation, right? Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, um, more of a, a work smarter, not harder approach to animation, right? What I want to talk about today is process. Um, because 
some of this is going to be familiar to you. It's actually one of the few things I have a, a actual PowerPoint presentation about. Look at this. I'm all like, like a real teacher or something. Um, display settings. Let's swap presentation. There we go. So, um, look at that. PowerPoint. Look at the little thing. It's like, it's like the gradient background. The default PowerPoint background. I'm like a teacher. Um, Who are you? I know. I <laughs> Actually, I, I have several of these, and it's because there's certain things that I feel like I need to go over multiple times. I actually like this as like boring as so many PowerPoint presentations are. This allows me to stay on track so I don't blab too much. Um, one of the things I do want to cover really quickly before I jump into this, though, is what happens on Friday. So um, because of that momentum suck that happens from fall break and spring break, a lot of teachers will sometimes say we're going to have class on Friday, right? Um, I am not going to have a lecture on Friday. I will be in the building, um, but Friday is still a work day for us, and I just wanted to kind of touch on that. Um, having said that, work days in here seem to be kind of, it's usually just Amy. Like, it's really just straight up. Amy's usually the only one in the room. I recognize that, um, and I, I just want to I want to remind you to think about the number of hours you put into the project. Okay? Um, if I if I could if I could have you accurately measure the number of hours you put into a project, that's actually the thing that would drive your grade. Right? To me, I would rather you get a poor result and have invested hours into trying then get a great result that you did in like 30 minutes right um like your result is not really the key to being in college it's the growth part of it and the only way you get that is with extra hours of effort right um so i, I want to encourage you to like find pockets of time in your day where you can continue to add more effort into this. If you feel like you're behind, that's probably why, is because you, you could find some more opportunities to add. It's the same reason you would feel like you're behind on an English paper, is that you didn't work on your English paper outside of class, right? Um, and so my, my guess is that it's that. It's also that this is a big project, right? This is a, I'm not, I don't want to imply that you're all like, you know, laying down on the job or anything. It's like it's that this is a larger scope project that takes up the, the entire semester, and it's very hard to pace a large amount of work for that. Right? It's, it's very easy to be like, I'll work on that next week, and then next week to be like, I'll work on that next week, and then next week to be like, I'll work on that next week. So, um, like one of the things that I do think will be helpful is to consciously think to yourself periodically, outside of class. How many hours have I put on? Have I put in on that project? And if your answer is one, <laughs> or zero, or negative two, then then like that's then that's going to be like just increasing that number is how you make more you know, progress. I know I say that to people who have a full time schedule and you have other classes and you have teachers that you know yell much louder than I do. Um, but still, I just want to kind of encourage you to kind of, you know, try to, um, like, this is where you would start ramping up your momentum on the project as much as you can, particularly if you're feeling like you're falling a little behind on it. So um, I have actually a lot of high hopes on this, though. Walking around, I see some great work. Um, how many of you managed to make it to any of the portfolio reviews? Yeah, cool. <laughs> is that uh, So, um, I, that is, I eventually, like your work is going to be up there, and um, and I think that we were able to see like sort of the dir direct results of that effort. A couple of people had small snippets this time in portfolio review from this class, which was good and bad. So. <laughs> Some of, some of those snippets were like, oh, yeah, you should have put that in there. But some of them were very strong. Like some of them, like, that's my hope is that this class starts becoming a class that you get some projects 
um, or some pieces out of that you would put in your portfolio, right? Um, and to do that, we have to get it across that finish line, right? What you actually may have saw are the ones that we were like, uh, that one wasn't finished. Um, was because that wasn't finished. They needed an extra week of time, right? Um, and so I think that we're, I'm really trying to scale this class to where we can get something finished that you can be proud of and just put it in your demo reel or maybe even do something bigger with it, so. Okay, um, any questions about any of this? I, again, I will be around on Friday. Um, we have a couple of, like the midpoint review stuff uh, for the sophomores is due tonight at midnight. So they are all frantically running in circles and sending me panicked emails about why the render farm isn't working. Um, the fact that I'm getting that, those emails on the day that it's due, <laughs> um, it's called survival of the fittest. No, no. Oh, I've got more emails over fall breaks from fall break from students than I do during a regular week. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, deadline, right? I guess it really was a good portion of them was that. Uh, it's cool though. They're frantically working on that. But we have a meeting on Friday where we're going to be reviewing some of that. So I will be in the building. Um, come grab me. But I'm not for sure. I, our digital media meetings, sometimes they're an hour long. Sometimes they're four hours long. They really are kind of hard to predict. So uh, I'll be hopping in and out. If you ever come in to class during class time and I'm not here, I, I almost guarantee you I'm somewhere downstairs, either in my office or helping another student or whatever. So, um, so come find me if you're if you're still needing some some stuff. I'd also like to look at your um, uh, exercise three uh, milestone with you at some point. Um, if if I don't get to, that's all right. I'll be checking it out. I also want to acknowledge the fact that I am way behind on the grading. That is something that I'm going to be catching up on very soon. So I apologize on that. Um, okay, animation process. Some of you haven't actually animated very much since you were in animation fundamentals. Um, so I thought I'd go through this today of animating. This is how you do it, right here. Uh, <laughs> So um, I think that the interesting thing is um, animation, I think people think of it the wrong way. Animation is not a, a, a skill you're born with, right? Um, um, an animator uh, isn't a technical, uh, animation isn't necessarily a technical process. It's much more like a craft, right? It's like knitting. You, um, it doesn't require a long, intricate process like, tree, um, it's very small, simple tasks that you repeat over and over again, right? Um, in fact, I can teach most people how to make animation, with air quotes, um, in, just a, in just a few minutes, right? It's, um, it's these three keys, right? We can move something, we can rotate it, we can hit S, and we set a keyframe. Yeah, you're an animator, go, right? Um, but like knitting, um, it's not necessarily about repeating those, it's not necessarily about um, a complicated process, it's about repeating these simple steps in a skillful way to achieve an animation, right? Um, so, um, you know, basic setting keyframes, you know, you got the object, um, you hit uh, S or you, you know, hit W to move it, right? Um, so we can place it wherever we want to. Um, we can hit S to set a keyframe, and you'll see the little tick mark that pops up, right? Oh, E is to rotate it, yeah. Um, so we can move it around, manipulate it however we want to. Um, when we're setting S, we're just creating a marker on those things in time, right? Um, and then we're going somewhere else on the timeline um, and uh, manipulating that W, E, and S, or W and E again to put it in a different location, put it in a different orientation, and then we're setting another marker on top, right? So you all are very familiar with this. Um, creating an animation is actually really easy. Um, the hard part, what you get paid for, is having control of that, right? If I wanted to um, make that animation go through that hoop, right, I need to add additional refinement to control that motion, right? Um, so I can do that with, you know, translate key and 
add another keyframe, and there we go. Now we have more refined motion. So it's still the same thing, W-E-S, 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 right, over and over again. It's not about um, a process, it's about using these simple tools to craft a, um, a believable performance, right? So, um, so rather than just pressing it uh, sort of willy-nilly, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that process today. So um, this is roughly what you're doing in class, right? Um, you're researching, um, you're doing your concept work, you're creating models, you're creating rigs, we're getting audio, but then um, all of that stuff is sort of part of the, the, the production pipeline, right? When it comes to animating, when it comes to actually making things move, this is the phase that, um, that we focus on most, right? So now that we're kind of in the animation phase or we're getting close to it, um, I wanted to remind you of all this stuff so you don't try to skip steps, right? So first and foremost, um, reference. So oh, let me look at these really quick. Reference, gathering your reference. Blocking, which is sort of getting your key uh, most important parts of the animation down as a series of poses. Poses on the entire character rig, right? not on just individual elements. Splining, which is using the graph editor to um, refine that motion um, a little more. And then polish is that level that we very rarely get to um, in a college class. Um, that's actually what we see in portfolios. Like I almost think of that as just polish time for all of that stuff you did while you're in college, right? That's where you sit down and you like make it like just freaking shine, right? Um, and so what I really like is if we can actually get to the polish phase in this class, right? Polish is the little things like if you're doing a character um, and your character like um, has their hand on their chest and they pull their hand off their chest. It doesn't just like lift off their chest. You actually feel the fingers like dragging along the, the fabric, sort of overshooting as they curl, right? Um, if you have a character touch something, you actually feel the like pressure in the tips of their fingers. Um, little things like easing in and out on the eyebrows or tracking the arcs of the corner of the mouth. Like these are actual things that animators do at the polish phase, right? Um, Polish is, the, is, is not the stuff that most people will usually see. Um, polish is the stuff that other animators see to validate that you are actually paying attention to, to that stuff that's important, right? Polish is the stuff that you don't see, it's the stuff that you feel, right? Um, and when it's not there, it feels just a little less um, finished, a little less believable, right? And then the final stage is exporting this out or rendering this out, depending, depending if you're doing this in a game or an animation, uh, a renderable animation setting, right? So let's get to these one at a time, reference and acting. Um, I'm gonna use a lot of examples from um, my own uh, animations, uh, stuff I've done um, for, mainly for Firaxis. Um, and so, you have been working on this part for a little while now, right? You've been looking up reference for your models, you've been looking up reference for um, your, your concepts, your colors, your lighting. You also need reference for your motion, right? Not all motion is the same. Um, Andrew, you're getting ready to animate something that is very like rubber hosey, like it's gonna have a very cartoony effect motion capture is not going to work for us, right? Like, whereas um, some of you maybe are doing something that's much more realistic, and um, you may want to uh, base that like solely off of uh, human action. Like, um, like Roberts, I'm pretty sure yours is not going to have a lot of squash and stretch in it, right? Like you're animating, um, you know, planes fighting each other. So, so these are things that you have to sort of think about. What is my, what do I want my motion to look like, right? Um, and you have to gather reference for that. Some of this is reference about the character, right? So for, I, why would I be basing this off of? Harold Hadrada uh, from Norway, who's one of the characters I animated for um, an expansion pack on Slip 6. 
Um, so the first thing I did when they told me I was going to be animating him is I started reading his Wikipedia page. I started Googling uh, historical like, documentaries about him. Right? I started trying to find out as much as I could about this guy because I wanted to make him um, a character that was believable. Right? Like, what is, what is some of his past? What is some of his um, things that motivate him? Right? My first instinct with Harold was to animate him as a um, sort of like a, a just a wild man, right? Like he they, they came in like was, he's a Viking comes in, he goes to the bar, they get drunk, they fight, they have a great time. Um, but that's not usually the type of person who ends up leading a country, right? So after I sort of sort of hashed out my version of that. Uh, talking with the art director, we worked back and forth, and he wanted him to be a little bit more of a um, a diplomat who uh, could fly off the handle a little easily, right? So like uh, you, you don't become a a a, um, a leader of a full civilization without being able to control your emotions. But when he cuts loose, he's going to like own your country after that's over with, right? Um, so we kind of had to balance that back and forth. Now, part of my animation is going to be based on that. Like when I, I want him to feel tense, like he's holding himself back, um, but still being diplomatic at times. But when he cuts loose, I wanted him to be like big, right? So that's sort of the, um, the ideas behind this. Now, it's going to be loosely based off of um, some audio. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the audio track that I use um, for this. Here. Can't hear it, can you? Let's see if we can. Uh, I bet the audio is. Turned off down here somewhere. Oh, escape. There we go. Yeah. So this is one of the audio clips that they would send to me um, that I would work with. Um, really the only point of having this is to um, uh, the only point of having this for me was less about the video a little bit about the lip sync, right? I am not going to use this guy's performance um, as my uh, performance. So um, what this, what he's saying in this is to victory, to the Hall of Odin, okay? So after I've analyzed this character, I know that like, Odin is a um, sort of a religious reference for them. Um, and basically this is his uh, declare war on you. You've You've done something, it's pissed him off, he's going to kill you. Um, and so what he says is like, you know, to victory, to the Hall of Odin, like he's like, we're gonna kill you, we're going to die. Like, <laughs> it's it's a, a battle cry, right? So I need to analyze the subtext, get into the character's head and understand why he would say that in order to get a performance out of it. And then I create my reference from this. Now, I'm going somewhat cartoony with this, but not super cartoony. It's still um, somewhat based in reality. Um, some of you may hear that and think, I don't, let's just go ahead and watch the reference that I got. So. <laughs> so this is the reference I shoot. Um, I, I put something on my head not necessarily because I need that um, for any form of motion. It's to remind myself while I'm moving that this character has something on his head, right? Um, so you're not going to go wagging your head around everywhere because your helmet would fly off, right? Um, it's more of a reference piece. Um, in some of my shots, he uh, he has like um, some uh, some weapons that he like, grabs and, and does stuff with. Um, and I think I had some animations where he actually takes off his helmet. So I did not have a Viking helmet, much to my dismay. So I used this strawberry bucket, um, which some delicious, delicious strawberries came in, um, to, to get this performance. Now, this for me was probably 
I, I'm guessing take number 18, some, some, somewhere in that neighborhood, right? What I do, I have a camera I keep in my office, I set it on top of my computer, I let the audio track play in a loop, and I shoot the reference over and over and over again. Um, I eventually narrow it down to the performance that I like best. Um, if you're working with an art director, you bounce that off of them too to see, um, to get their feedback from it. Now, I know a lot of people are just shy, right? Um, you don't like standing in front of a camera. That's why you're an animator is because you didn't want to be in front of a camera. Um, and so like, it's, this is hard for some people. Um, and the uh, comforting words of advice I have is get over it. Like you have to do it anyway. Um, I have a whole folder full of embarrassing reference of me, um, embarrassing reference of everybody. Everybody has embarrassing reference video. I'm sharing this with you to let you know everyone has embarrassing reference video. You don't have to share yours with everybody, right? You, you can keep yours. It's just fine to not like feel like you need to like, hey, look at this stupid goofy thing I did for my animation, right? That's for your use, right? This is not going to go out with the game or with the animation. Um, having said that, it's, it's not really a, an optional element either. Uh, you have to be able to analyze motion. Even if you are doing something super cartoony, like rubber hosey, right? Um, you can still take something from that, whether it's timing, whether it's weight, whether it's whatever, shooting reference in your version of that and, and compiling multiple uh, pieces of reference so you can pull little bits from different things um, is going to be um, like, like practically a requirement to get something that's not boring, right? So um, again, I'll play it one more time so we can, all right, so. So, from there, we move on to the blocking phase. Blocking is where we're going to extrapolate the most important parts of that animation, the most important poses, um, in order to um, sort of craft that motion, right? So again, pose to pose animation, some of you um, are gonna see some of these uh, from, from previous lectures. If you haven't seen these lectures before, oh, that means they're coming up in another class. Um, so again, key poses are done by the keyframe animator, right? And then, and the, this is a traditional uh, method, um, and then the in-betweens are done by an assistant, right? They do all these. Um, so in theory, if you have strong pose, um, strong key poses, then you're going to get stronger in-betweens. It's not a guarantee. It's not going to fix all of your in-betweens. It's just going to give you a better starting point for those in-betweens. So if you've taken the animation fundamentals class, which everybody here I think has, um, you'll have gone through my pose lecture where I give that really long like breakdown of all of that stuff. I think it's probably one of my better lectures. Um, and I have it on tape somewhere, or I have it on YouTube. Tape. Yeah, I have it on a beta, a beta max if you want to take it home watching your VCR. I, I have it on YouTube somewhere if you want to, if you want to watch that. Um, but basically it's about crafting a strong pose. If you have strong poses, that's going to get you a long way toward um, a better animation. So, um, Again, post is about the uh, relationship between the character, the scene, and the camera. Um, it's, it tells us a lot about the, um, the characteristics of the character themselves, like this fine individual here. Um, you want to invite him to tea. Um, in, my in my opinion, um, posing is one of the most important elements of animation, if not the most important element. I would say the only other one that even comes close is time. Um, posing is like, 90% of selling a performance, right? Um, so poses are composed of, or a strong pose is composed of contrapposto, line of action, and silhouette. Now, I'm going to go through those kind of quickly. Um, the pose lecture is a much more in-depth look at all of these. This is more of a reminder, right? 
So contrapposto first. This is Italian for countering pose or countering posture. Art history teachers love this word. It basically just means your shoulders and your hip angle um, have a countering relationship, right? Um, so, um, for example, we'll, we'll start with, um, what's this guy's name again? Franklin, right? Um, Franklin has absolutely no contrapposto here. You'll see his shoulder and his hips are both parallel. Parallel is boring. If we get a little bit of an angle in there, yay! Contrapposto, right? Contrapposto is one of the first things that we actually start seeing because we have a tendency to shift our weight, right? And when we shift our weight around, um, it naturally is going to cause that contrapposto. So, um, if Franklin um, is up on one foot, right, um, that's going to make him pull that hip up. That's going to make these, uh, his spine sort of curve a little bit, and we're going to naturally get that contrapposto in his, in his spine, right? So our weight is going to be the biggest influence of this. So um, the other element of pose that is really important, line of action. This is sort of this invisible line that you can draw through the character to um, imply a lot about their energy, right? So we get this smooth, swooping line of action. Um, that's going to be more physically um, efficient than these really like clumsy lines. Of, I try standing like the way that guy is, like it's hard, right? Um, if you're actually following a lot of how your anatomy works, you're going to get a little bit of a cleaner line of action. However, we have a tendency to be lazy and lines of action um, can get kind of boring. So we have to push them a little bit. Um, but in action, you can see that the line of action is really going to tell us a lot about that character's motion, right? Um, we've got this concave versus this convex line of action that's going to give you a stronger um, set of poses and a stronger animation in turn. So uh, Franklin now has some contrapposto but if we sort of follow his spine out through his feet and his head, we see that his line of action is a little like um, jagged there, right? And so we can just sort of shift him over like this to get a cleaner line of action, and that improves the pose, right? Uh, line of action is something we can use to also sell the character's um, emotions, right? So this was, uh, again, Harold. Um, during uh, one of his like greeting poses. This is him being proud, being like, I'm a herald and I'm awesome, right? And so what you'll see in this is the sort of leaning back line of action that feels like his chest is pulling him forward. And that chest pulling him forward gives us confidence, right? Later, if you defeat Harold in war, um, he gets this pose, right? A different line of action. And it feels like his head is heavy and it's pulling him down. So it's how um, this line of action can be used um, can drastically affect the way um, your poses and the emotion of your character is going to, um, to read. The third most important part of posing um, is silhouette. So we've always, um, we've, we've talked about this. If you've, if you've saw that pose lecture before, you know that when I pop this up, how many of you can tell me who this is? Thumbs up. Now I have the um, almost uncontrollable urge to sing the entire Mickey Mouse song. Um, um, obviously Mickey, right? It's very easy to read that just from his silhouette, right? Silhouette is about clarity of, 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 of readability. Um, if your visualization concentration, um, this is very important, right? You need to be able to read something very clearly immediately. Um, if anybody went to portfolio reviews and saw uh, Clay's presentation, he really talked about making sure your character's silhouettes were readable, um, even if it was based off of color. Like it's really about communication as efficiently and clearly as possible. Um, clarity is is king um, in this regard, right? And so when we see something like this, it's really kind of unclear what Franklin is doing. Right? Um, is he? Um, eating a sandwich? Is he texting someone? Is he um, like shaving his chest? Like, what is Franklin doing, right? Um, but if we just break out his silhouette a little bit, we can start to see that he's at least contemplating something in his hand, 
right? And all that really was was just actually rotating his character a little bit so we can see his silhouette more clearly. And we'll see that what he's actually doing is sort of thinking about a Rubik's Cube, right? Um, he's almost got it, too. Just one more turn. You can do this, Franklin. Um, but when we're like this, we, we can't quite see that as clearly. If we look, we can read it and be like, oh, he's, he's doing something with a Rubik's Cube. Um, so what is just going to clarify that? And you don't want to make your audience have to work to, to understand what's happening, right? Um, so silhouette is extremely important in animation because some elements happen so quickly that if there's not a strong silhouette to it, we would miss it, right? Like these, these little moments like these are like, they're important and they're fleeting. So like if you blink and you miss that, like that's what, that's what a strong pose is for us, to make sure as many people catch that awesome pose as possible, right? Um, so just by sort of pushing Franklin's silhouette a little bit more, um, we can more clearly sort of show what he's doing. So what I'm going to do, again, back to my reference, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to use um, this reference to derive strong poses um, for my key poses, right? Um, and that's the blocking path. So we do this. Yes. So that's my key pose. Turn it down a little bit. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So you'll see what I've kind of done is I've gone through. Um, I've used my reference um, to figure out what my character is doing, and I've. I have crafted stronger poses um, than what I was able to do um, just because I wasn't conscious of the camera enough. Right? And because I'm not, a, I'm not Harold, like I'm, I'm a different person. How do I make that silhouette more clear? How do I make his contrapasso more clear, his line of action? Um, all of those things are things that I'm thinking about for the key moments of this motion, right? So when he does that point, I need the anticipation back. I need the point. Um, and then later, I would, I would sort of break that down to get like a, an in-between in there, right? So this is the point where you stop and think about timing. Right? Timing is, in that key posing phase, is something that's very easy to um, overlook. Right? You, 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 if you watch your animation with bad timing enough, it will start to look like the timing is good. Um, the reason we stop here and focus on timing is that once you start splining, once you start like doing more detail to this, um, timing gets harder to control. Right? Or no, timing gets more destructive to change. Right? Um, if you polish forever on your curves and then you scale the entire animation or scale like sections of it, it's going to mess up a lot of those curves. So think about your timing before you get too far into this. So the next stage is blocking plus. Um, a lot of people will still kind of lump this into blocking, um, but this is breaking down or refining those key poses, right? So we have two key poses here. We have character looking um, to their right and character looking to their left, right? So these are key, the two key poses that are necessary to show a character looking from right to left, right? We can kind of go back and forth through those two. Right to left. Um, if we let Maya decide what happens in between those, we get this. Right? And that's not a strong pose. Right? That's not, I mean, it's not terrible, I guess, but it's really dull. Right? Like that's, a, that's a very dull transition to that. Um, so when we're talking about breakdown poses, if we're talking about being in control of how Maya um, blends in between one strong pose to another, right? Um, we're just going to go in there and keep making more key poses until that motion looks exactly the way we want it to, right? So I could do a breakdown like this, and what we're going to get is that sort of dip of the head as he goes across. Or I could do one like this, where we get sort of that, um, like he sort of, like almost is hopping over to the other pose. I could sort of have the character favor the first pose a little bit in that transition, and it's going to make him feel like he's easing out and popping to that last pose. 
or I can drag different parts of the body. I can have as many breakdown poses as I need um, to um, sort of refine that motion um, the way I want to, right? So I can have this like dragging at the beginning and sort of a dip and a dragging toward the end that sort of pops up to the end. Or I can have the character feel like certain body parts are leading, right? I can do a breakdown pose where the character's face is leading this motion um, and the top of the head is kind of like dipping forward and going across, right? Um, or vice versa, it could be dragging um, his head, right? So once we've done all of that, once we've done all of our breakdown poses, and breakdown poses are one of those things where um, you kind of decide where you're going to stop. Because the less you define in your breakdown poses, the more work you have to do in your graph editor. Um, I like to pose, I would say, somewhere in the neighborhood of um, every, I would say every five to 10 frames, I usually have a breakdown key. Now, I know some animators who break it all the way down to like threes or fours. Um, and I know some animators who do less than that and do a lot more work in the graph editor. Um, that's kind of your call. So once you've done all of that, now it's time to get into the graph editor. Now, the graph editor is um, a pain in the butt. I recognize that. How many of you still kind of dread opening the graph editor? Anybody? OK, good. And open it a lot. Because um, the only way to spline is one curve at a time. Right? Um, we, we go in, can you even see that? That's a little, little dim. Um, you go in, you find these curves, and you just clean them up one curve at a time. I probably should have chose um, rotate X because it's red. Um, so the way to think about these curves, I know you all are relatively familiar with this, um, is it's a way of controlling our ease in and our ease out of emotion, right? So it's how we control our spacing. And so if we want this object to feel like it's easing in and out at the top and bottom, we need to ease our curve like that. If we want sharp points, we sort of break those in uh, certain locations, right? So this is, this is how the graph editor works. This is how, um, you know, Hopefully you're familiar with this. If not, like, even if you're like still kind of questioning, like, what you need to be able to do is hop into the graph editor and be in complete control of the motion, right? <coughs> and that just takes time. Like, there's there's no shortcut to that. I can show you images like this all day long. Um, and although these are like pretty decent examples of it, um, really you're not going to feel like you're in control of it until you really just feel comfortable in the graph editor. Um, the thing that most people think I'm exaggerating about, though, is you have to adjust every curve on the entire character. Um, by the time it's finished, you really, I mean, even if you just open it up and say, oh, no, those fingers are OK, um, because you look at them. Like, not because I don't have time to deal with them, those fingers are OK. Um, you look at them and like, yeah, that's what I wanted them to do, right? But you go through every one of them and you make any adjustments that are necessary. It may seem like that adjustment is so small that it's not going to make a difference. Um, editing your splines are one of those things where <clears throat> you make a whole bunch of tiny changes and they add up over time. There's not like one thing you change and suddenly your animation is better. Um, it's that you work on it for two hours and even though you can't notice a significant difference, your animation is much better, right? Um, it's one of the lesser rewarding parts of animation because it feels like you're not making progress, right? One of the ways that some people spline that maybe is helpful is that they will spline um, a limited section of their animation um, all at once, right? Like, so they will do like frames one through 40 before moving on to frames 41 through 70, right? And then they get that frames 1 through 40 perfect on every motion. And so that's one way you could consider doing it. Everybody kind of has a different way of working. So, Okay, some of the things we're trying to control with this and some of the things you may manually have to go in and clean up is your arcs. Now we can do that with a motion tracker, but again, all things sort of move in an arc. 
And Maya has a tendency for like a small thing to cause a little hitch in the arc, right? Instead of getting these smooth swoops in your arm, you may halfway through that have one little bobble where the, the arm sort of pops up, right? Um, you can do that with the end of a motion trail, just tracking parts of your character's body and making sure those arcs are clean. And then finally, overlapping action. We've all talked about this before. Um, overlapping action just means things start and stop moving at different times. So if we um, click play on this, we've all talked about this one in Principles of Animation Fundamentals. Right? He releases the slinky at the top. The bottom doesn't start moving until that signal reaches the bottom. Right? Um, this is overlapping action. Not everything happens at the same time. Um, things happen, things move because a force um, caused them to move and sometimes the information of that force um, just takes a little bit of time to get to um, the end of that chain, right? Uh, if I suddenly took off and started running, my shirt would drag behind me, maybe my arms would drag behind me a little bit, right? Um, so all these things have start to stop at different times. The way they start and stop at different times tells us a little bit about um, their properties, right? Um, all right? For some reason, that one takes a minute to start. Um, so the first one is moving like kind of a, a springy jitter, or the second one's much looser and more flowy, right? Both of these have overlapping action, but the way that overlapping action functions tells us something about that object's properties, right? So. Here comes some audio again. Um, after we've done all of that splining, thought about all the arts. Tears, tears. This is kind of the animation I'm getting. Um, this one still is a little pitchy. It's not bad. Um, something that um, is an element to consider. I, I'm doing this for games, and so when I export this to a game engine, the game engine is going to run an algorithm on it in order to simplify the animation. And sometimes that messes up parts of the animation. Um, and so sometimes what you see in Maya, you have to exaggerate just a touch or have to work on just a touch because the compression is going to mess it up. Um, I don't do my lighting and rendering for these. There's, there are other people who are much better at that. Um, it's exported into a game. Um, they do some more material work to it. And it takes it from this to this. So that's basically what you see in the game. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Till cell. Um, now, I know you're doing all of this process. You're doing the, um, the lighting, you're doing the rendering, you're doing all of that. Um, so you have to switch gears a little bit, right? Um, one of the reasons I, I break this class up in that way is because the keyframe parts is what most people want to do when they're in animation but not only what they want to do. Um, some people really enjoy modeling and they want to have a career where they can do, where they can generalize just a little bit. There are also some jobs that being able to be a little bit of a generalist um, will give you an advantage over the other applicants, right? If, if they don't have someone to do the rigging and you're like, I can do some rigging and I can do some light modeling, then then you may you know, stand a better chance of getting that because you, you, can, be, you can wear multiple hats. Um, those jobs are usually smaller studios. Smaller studios are sometimes really good jobs. Actually, sometimes they're better jobs because they have more control over the things um, that they do, right? You, you, um, you're not just the rock modeler. You're the person who can have more input on the overall project. Um, the other thing about that is those studios get to manage their own budgets a little bit more, um, which means um, if that studio is doing well, then when you get a bonus, you buy a Lamborghini with that, not a, a bigger sandwich at Subway. Right? Um, th there are literally stories uh, from, from uh, when, when I worked at For Access, we were owned by 2K. Uh, 2K is a, a good owner to have, um, but it, when Firaxis was independent, um, 
they got different they had a different bonus structure so when i would get a bonus for like you know we would do like high sales or something like that we we, we did really well or we finished something on time we would get a bonus and it would be like an extra two thousand dollars or something like that um and i was talking to some of the people who had worked there longer and they said when we were in an independent studio when you got a bonus you bought a house like that's one of the benefits of being in a smaller studio. You may not always do, get the glamorous stuff, but if you have an amazing contract with some company and they just need four people to do it, like sometimes you just get to receive those perks a little bit more, right? Um, so think about that. Like that's one of the reasons we, we kind of cover the entire pipeline, not just the keyframe parts. So again, to kind of go through this process a little more quickly, um, Tamara of Georgia, she was one of the other characters I did for that, um, that game. Um, it was, or for that expansion pack. Um, did a lot of research on her because I had no idea who she was. Um, she was extremely interesting, actually. And after I looked at her character design, read a lot about her biography, I realized I wanted her to be a strong, um, yet like intimidating woman, right? Um, and my thinking was she was Emily Gilmore if Emily Gilmore had an army. Yes, I love the Gilmore Girls. I don't care what you say, it's an awesome show. Um, <laughs> like, anyway, it was, it was awesome. It was somewhere a, a combination between this or between her and um, Maggie Smith. Um, but Maggie Smith was a little too British. Um, so she was very, I wanted her to be very proper, but I also wanted it to be conveyed that if she sort of wagged her finger in the right way, um, they would level your country, right? Like, she's like, oh. I control a giant army with my pinky, right? Like it, it is very like um, she 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 leads through will, right? Now, this character is um, a uh, a lady in her probably fifties, maybe sixties, right? Is who Tamara was was sort of aiming at, right? I am not. Um, I am a fat middle-aged white man. Um, I still needed reference. Um, so this is not, I, I, I still look like a, a guy doing this, but some of the things I had to take into consideration in doing these uh, actions is um, I, I kept my elbows tight, like close to my sides, right? I tried to do a lot of small hand gestures when I was talking, um, and that allowed me to feel like I was, I was giving like subtle commands that had lots of power. Um, I also tried to, um, if you think of like um, sort of the Emily Gilmore idea, she's very proper, which means she stands with good posture and like has her chin up a lot, and some people would say nose up a lot, and so that, that sort of head back um, proud um, <coughs> posture was a lot of what I was going for in this. Um, so. So this is one of her, like this is one of her most expressive animations. So even my reference, I felt like it was a little too big. I also needed to like make it a little bit more feminine. So there's certain things in the contrapposto that I exaggerate um, when I go on to um, the blocking phase. Now there was an element in her rig where the, um, uh, where when I had this in stepped mode, um, it uh, closed her eyes. Um, so even though I animated her with her eyes open, this blocking pass has her eyes closed. Um, it's worth mentioning that I usually do this pass um, in stepped mode, and that's way that way I'm only focusing on the key poses, right? So all that stuff that Maya does in between, I'm not even seeing it, right? And then we move on to sort of the splining pass. And then finally, okay, so that's where we're at. Um, for some of you, this is probably more of a refresher than anything, right? Um, but I need you to kind of get your head in the animation game. Uh, and so that's what I wanted to sort of talk about today. Uh, sort of getting you back in that mindset of setting keyframes and making things move. 
this is the process that I do day in and day out when, when working on animations, whether it's for a little bitty character, um, or whether it's for something completely cartoony, or whether it's for something photorealistic. Even if I'm editing motion capture, I still think about all of these same elements, right? Just a little bit of a different process here. Um, what I am going to talk about in the next few class periods is sort of some, some tricks, um, some things that will allow you to um, sort of animate uh, a little more efficiently. So for example, if I told you you needed to do a solar system, right? Um, the hardest possible way to do that is to try to animate each of those planets in a circle with 100 little keyframes, right? Um, there's the way that you could do that that would take you hours, and the ways that you could do that that would take you like two minutes, right? I could probably, like, I kind of want to kind of want to try these sometimes. I want to try like time trials and be like, I can animate your entire solar system in 45 seconds. Ready? Go. Um, <laughs> there are some there's some really simple tricks you can do, and some of it involves um, thinking about sort of the root of a motion and a motion, and some of it involves um, thinking about how timing is offset. Right. So um, we'll cover some of that next class period. Um, hopefully this has been helpful. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, um, anybody have any questions on any of this? Comments? Ideas? All right. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the PowerPoint, uh, stop the video, upload the video. Um, I'm, yeah, i will upload the video. So I will, uh, and then after that, I'll sort of hop around, uh, sort of peek over your shoulder and see how everything's going. But, Otherwise, class is yours. <clears throat>